If you're new here or if you're newer here, we just want to welcome you, man. We've been praying for you. Uh, we, we've been praying that God would speak to you, that God would encourage you, that this wouldn't just be like a one-time sort of thing, that God has you here right now because he's trying to remind you that there's a community of people who, who love God and who love people. And so whatever you need, God has. You hear what I'm saying? Like whatever you need, God is. And, and so whatever you, you're going through, whatever you know, situation that you find yourself in, I just want to remind you that the answer is God. That he has everything that you've, you've ever desired. It's in him. And so we're, we're a church that loves God and loves people. Someone say amen. 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 Our desire is that you would walk into this place today and you wouldn't feel out of place. You wouldn't feel judged. You wouldn't feel overlooked. But you would know that not only is there a God in heaven that loves you, but there is people here on earth that love you too. Right. Do you hear what I'm saying to you this morning? I, I just want to remind some people today, all right? And so we're starting a brand new series today. And, um, and I'm so thankful that you're here. My encouragement to you would be stick, stick around through the whole series. It's called Money. Let's talk about it. And some of you right now are going, see, I told you we shouldn't have came. I, I already, I tried to tell you this morning, girl, we shouldn't have come to church. Now we've got to sit through this dude talking about money. Here we go. Here we go. My, my prayer and my heart is that uh, this series would give us a biblical understanding uh, of what money is. Because the truth is, we all talk about it. We all stress about it. <laughs> we all pray about it, right? And so we're already talking about it and doing all these things, so we might as well have a conversation in church. And so um, God has given us this, this tool to use to, to bless his people. And so let's look at God's design for money. And um, I don't want you to get distracted by the headline, okay? Because, you know, sometimes, come on, we could be distracted by headlines, right? Uh, we live in a culture today where headlines are everything. You, you know you don't read the full article, you ain't reading all those comments, right? You ain't reading everything. You just look at the headline. So I don't want you to get distracted by the headline because I'm going to talk about so much more than just money. I'm going to talk about your life, okay? Um, and, and let me just say this because I know as soon as we talk about money in church, you're, the guards go up. P oh, pastor just wants my money. But church just wants my money. Let me just say this. I've been in ministry for almost 11 years now, okay? Almost 11 years. I've only ever gotten paid for one and a half of those years, Okay? And so what I'm doing now, I've been doing free for almost 10 years. Okay, so let's, it's not about the money. Um, but, but I do understand why some people get scared when they talk about money, because churches and pastors and leaders have abused the money and used the topic of money to manipulate. And let me just say, this church is not that. I, I believe that God is going to build his church with or without you. Come on, somebody. And so, so for those of you who give to God's house, man, I'm grateful for you. I'm thankful for you. I pray every day that God will continue to bless you. And if you never give a dime to this house, you're still welcome here. Okay? So, so just hear my heart. Um, Jesus never avoided the topic of money. He talked about it a lot. And let me also just say this as a disclaimer. I started a business in 2016 that I very ever, uh, rarely even promote, never hear from the pulpit. Um, it's a business that's completely... Um, detached from church. It has nothing to do with church. It's a, a totally separate industry. And I believe that um, God has given me this business to help support my family in ministry. And, and it's a gift from God. I very rarely even promote it or talk about it. And, and I say that just to kind of bring the tension down a little bit. This is not about money for, for, for me. This is not about money for our family. Um, this series will help you with your money. Amen. Uh, it, it will give you a biblical perspective on how to, how to manage money, how to, how to steward your money, how to live a life of generosity. And let me just make a bold statement uh, to start out, okay? I, I don't believe that anyone is bad with money. I, I believe that everyone is good with money. You say, Pastor Brown, you never met my wife. <laughs> right, bro, let me have you over. I'll show you how bad we are with money. You say, you're going to have to explain yourself on that one. Uh, I don't believe anyone is bad with money. I believe that we all invest and spend money on things that we value. You hear what I said? We all spend money and invest in things that we value. So it's not that you're bad with money. It's just you're spending money on things that maybe you shouldn't be valuing. Right. See, some of us, we value comfort more than we do financial security. Right? We, we value uh, convenience more than we do budgeting. Right? We, we value uh, an escape. Right? A vacation. Uh, a drug, like getting out of the situation more than we do generational wealth, right? We value short-term satisfaction over long-term peace. And so it's not that you're bad with money. You just really have your priorities messed up. You're valuing things and spending money on things and investing into things that probably you shouldn't be. Come on, we all know the people who live at home with their mama, have all kinds of bills, right? 
but got a Disneyland pass. Don't look at him, but you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Come on, we all, we all know people that they ain't got no money for nothing else, but they're buying the latest Jordans. Come on, we all know people like that. See, money is not a thing that you can be bad with, but your life is something that you can be bad with. And so if, if, if you or, or someone you know, you would say, man, I'm bad with money or they're bad with money, it's really just a reflection that you're bad at managing your life. Um, and see, God doesn't want just one part of your life to thrive, right? He doesn't want you to, to just be blessed financially, but, but, but cursed spiritually, right? He doesn't want you to be blessed relationally, but, but overflowing spiritually. He doesn't want you to be, you know, have all kinds of friends, but be broke. He, he, he wants your whole life to be, to be good. Come on, he, he's the God of all of it, right? And, and so that's what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about all of it. This is not just about a money series. It's about managing your, your life and living life God's way. The goal of this series is not just to manage money, it's to manage your life the way God wants you to live. Um, the other day, I was at my, my in-law's house, and my niece came up to me, and uh, it, it blessed my heart. She said, Bran, I- I'm going to tithe at church for the first time tomorrow. She's nine years old. She said, I'm going to tithe for the first time tomorrow. I said, I saw she showed me her $10 bill. And I said, that's amazing. I'm so proud of you. We had a little conversation. So why do you want to tithe? She said, I-, I don't know. I just want to give. I said, well, not only do I recognize you, and, and that's amazing, but God sees you too. And she's just like, I was like, oh, I received that. And then my son was there. He's like, Dad, what's the tithe? <laughs> I'm like, bro, right? we talked about this, son. But, but see, here's the reality. Half of you are my niece and half of you are my son, right? Half of you are going, man, I can't wait to give. I, I want to bless you with my giving. I, I, wanna, I can't wait to show up to church tomorrow and just bless God. And half of you are going, what's the tithe? Do I have to give? What are we talking about money, right? Um, And so we're going to answer a lot of questions in this series. We're going to talk about things like, man, is is tithing, is giving, is that Old Testament or is that New Testament? We're going to talk about things like, um, was Jesus poor? Does God hate rich people? Like, we're going to talk about this stuff and hopefully answer some, some of your questions. We're going to talk about the, the prosperity gospel. You heard that before? Like, is there some truth to that? Is there not truth to that? Is there good things? Is it a bad thing? Uh, all this stuff, I want to teach you what the Bible does say and what the Bible doesn't say about money. Is that, is that fair? Yeah. So just some quick stats real quick. One, of, out, of, one of, uh, out of every 10 Bible verses in the New Testament deals with money. 2,350 verses, give or take, uh, in the whole Bible talk about money. 15% of Jesus' recorded words deals with money. Two times the amount of verses uh, are on money than there is on faith and prayer combined. 16 of Jesus' 36 parables, so almost half of Jesus' parables are about money. And, and our foundational scripture for this series is Matthew 6, 21. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Come on, we know that to be true. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So the title of this message is, is Heart Check. Heart Check. You didn't know you were coming to the doctor today, but you're here. We're here to have a heart examination. I love what the Amplified Version says in Matthew 6, 21. For where your treasure is, there your heart, your wishes, your desires, that on which your life centers will be also. See, that's why what you spend the most money on is the thing that you care about the most. Right? Because your heart follows your treasure. Not the other way around. So how do I really know that I love God and I love his church and I love his people? Well, I give to them. How do I really know that I love my kids other than just the words that I say? Well, hey, you can check my giving towards them. You can check my giving towards my wife. I'm financially invested. Why? Because my heart follows my treasure. Like I got a couple people in my life that just recently bought a new car and I'm like, I'm looking at their new car and I'm checking it out and it's amazing and it's great. And I'm like, nah, that car's sick. But I just love my car way more. Why? Not because my car is newer, nicer, faster, better, because I'm invested in my car. Right? So if they get in a crash, I'm like, dang, that sucks. Pray for you. I get in a crash, I'm like, no! Worst thing ever. Right? Because I'm invested into it. My heart follows my treasure. So there's nothing in your life that God wants more than your heart. He don't want your money. He wants your heart. See, John the Baptist, the older cousin of Jesus, he would go out and he would preach and he would teach repentance, right? He, he would preach this message of turning from your sin and turning to God. And once he would, he would tell people about turning from their sin and there's a better way to live. See, how many know that sometimes we just need a repentance message 
like last week, I called a lot of people to repentance, right? You got, you got to turn from your wicked ways. You got to turn from your sin, and you got to turn to God. See, John would go out, and he would preach this message. Turn from your wicked ways. Turn to God and be baptized. That's why he got the nickname John the Baptist. And so by the, by the droves, people would come, and they would repent. They would be baptized, and then they would ask the question like many of us ask, what's next? What, what do we do now? I've said the prayer. I've been baptized. I read my Bible. I go to church. I sing the songs. What now? How do I prove? How do I show people that I actually love Jesus, that I follow Jesus? Like, how do I prove I'm a Christian? You ever thought, like, what do I do next? You ever had that thought before? Okay, now what do I do? Watch this. This is uh, Luke chapter 3, verse 10. The crowds ask, what should we do? John replied, if you have two shirts, give one to the poor. If you have food, share it with those who are hungry. Even corrupt tax collectors came to be baptized and asked, teacher, what should we do? He replied, collect no more taxes than the government requires. What should we do? Asked some soldiers. John replied, don't extort money or make false accusations or, and be content with your pay. Notice, people are asking what repentance looks like. People are asking what the Christian life looks like. And John replies with two answers. Number one, treat people differently. And number two, treat money differently. Did you see it? Treat people differently and treat money differently. You want to you wanna prove, you want to show, you want to really have evidence that God is working in your life? Well, how do you treat people and how do you treat money? That will be a good indicator on how you know God is really working in your life. I'm more generous with my love. I'm more generous with my words. I'm more generous with my time. I got more grace for people. I'm more generous with my, with my finances. But that's how I can prove that, that I love God, that I love his people. See, your new life in Christ should immediately result in generosity. The Apostle Paul, he's teaching, uh, he's actually collecting an offering from the church in, um, in Philippi. This church in uh, Jerusalem, he, he's collecting an offering for them. And, and he goes, hey, you were the only ones that gave me financial help when I first brought you the good news. You were the only ones who gave when I brought you the gospel. You, you were the only ones that sowed a seed. When I first brought you the good news, why? Because our response to the gospel, our response to the good news should be generosity. Yeah. When you hear the good news, it should cause us to be generous people. Why? Because God so loved the world that he gave. He gave. See, this whole thing, our whole religion, everything that we are, are built on is on a principle of generosity. And let's just be very, very clear here. We don't give to purchase salvation. Okay? We don't, we don't give to purchase salvation. We, we give to thank God for salvation. Right. I, I give because I've been saved. I give because I've been set free. I give because I've been delivered from my trespasses, and I want other people to have an opportunity to know the God that I know. Right. I, I want other people to have an opportunity to fall in love with the God that I'm in love with. Yes. See, the gospel is free, but buildings are not. Uh-oh. <laughs> Ministry is not free. Vision is not free. Kids' ministry is not free. They're not eating free Cheez-Its right now. Someone bought those, right? And, and so I give because of what God has done in my life, and I want other people to have, have an opportunity to experience the love, the grace, the truth of who God is. So write this down, a couple points for you this morning. God wants your heart. So, so giving is not an obligation. Giving is an opportunity. Pastor Brent, are we, are we obligated to give? Like, like, do I have to give? I see the basket go by. Am I going to be struck down? Am I going to be cursed if I don't put anything in the offering? Like, you're, you're talking about money. Like, do I have to give, Pastor Brent? What's the rules on it? That's like, you know, asking my wife, am I obligated to take you on date night? <laughs> like, do I have to? Do I have to give you flowers? Do I have to treat you good? See, in the context of a healthy, loving relationship, those are dumb questions, <laughs> right? Do I have to give? Do I have to serve? Do I have to tithe? In the context of a healthy, loving relationship, dumb questions. Am I obligated to clean the house? Do I have to make you dinner? Right? Do I have to, you know, buy, give you money for hair and nails and Botox and all that stuff? Did I say that? I didn't mean to. <laughs> Dumb questions. Why? Because in the context of a healthy, loving relationship, I mean, I want to serve my wife. I, I want to bless her. I want to take care of her. So am I obligated? No, of course not. But I want to because I love her. 
right? So she said, amen, that's good. She said, that's good preaching, that's good preaching. See, God doesn't want your money. He wants your heart. He wants you to love him. He wants to be in a relationship with you. It's not an obligatory tithe that I give because of some consequence of if I don't. Like, I don't take my wife on a date because, I mean, if I don't, then she's really going to, no, no, no. I, I want to. I get to. It's an opportunity, not an obligation, right? I, I, imagine with me for a moment, like, if you have kids in here and your kid's are like, Dad, are you coming to my game? Mom, are you coming to my game? And you go, do I have to come? <laughs> like, do it. What happens if I don't? Like, that'd be weird, right? You know, your friend invites you over for a party. You're like, do I have to? Am I obligated to come? Do I have to? Like, what? Imagine for like if you if you're a dad and, and and your daughter's about to get married and she's like dad would you walk me down the aisle and you're like do I have to <laughs> what would, what would the response be of like well I don't even want you there right like like don't if that's how you feel then don't even come do I have to tithe do I have to give well if that's if that's your question like don't even like it's not about the money God wants your heart yeah. it's not an obligation. It's an opportunity. So I get to sit down with my kids and I get to teach them about giving and generosity and stewardship and and what we're going to prepare to offer and what what we give and how all this looks like. And what an opportunity that I get to to sit down with my kids and disciple them. It's not an obligation. Well, pastor's talking about money again. And by the way, just so you know, three and a half years, almost in church, I've never even preached a message on money. So relax, calm down. (laughs) Because I already know that some of you, all we talk about is money. What? Name name a time. Find it. Like Like we don't even talk about it really. Like, like, man, we're, we're madly in love with God. We can clearly look around and see God's moving in this place. It's not, a, it's not an obligation to give. Man, I get to give. I get to serve, yeah. right? Yeah. What an opportunity that we have. And while we're here, let's talk about it. See, some of us were like, well, um, do I have to serve in kids' ministry? Like, if you need me, then I will. But if, like, if you got people, <laughs> we don't even, like, no. <laughs> no. If you don't want to, don't do it. It's not about the thing. It's about your heart. God wants your heart. Well, if you need me to, like, you know, come and serve, then I'll do it. Never mind. (laughs) You hear what I'm saying to you? Like, seriously, it's not about the thing. It's about your heart. This is a heart check. How's your heart? Um, Nothing great is ever built with the spirit of obligation. Like, if if you have to do it, it's like, chill. We'll just do it ourselves. Nothing great, nothing significant has ever been built out of an obligatory spirit. Um, so, so we've decided as a church, man, man, we're looking for people who, if we're going to build a life-giving, a fresh, a relevant church that's alive and people that are full of faith, then we have to do it with people that are passionate about, passionate about building God's house, that are passionate about seeing people saved that are passionate about seeing people get set free and delivered and find community and know God and, and all the things. Like we, we got to get people that, that see it as an opportunity, not an obligation, because generosity is our privilege. Man, we're blessed to give. We give more than what's required. If we're going to build a, a church, a, a people uh, that reaches our community, if we're going to you know, build a church that our kids actually want to come to and not have to come to, come on, if we're going to have a, a, a gathering place that your husband wants to come to, and not, not drag them to, if we're going to build that type of church, then we got to be people that see what we're doing as an opportunity, not an obligation. I, I don't have to be here, man. I get to be here. I, I don't have to preach, man. I get to preach. I, I don't have to pray, man. I get to pray. I, I don't have to serve, man. I get to serve. I, I get to love on people. I get to care for people. I get to meet the needs of the people. It's not an obligation. Man, God has been so good to me. God has blessed me so I can be a blessing. That's, that's the type of people I'm looking for. It's not an obligation. It's, a, it's an opportunity. Pastor, is it Old Testament or New Testament? Just get to the point already. (laughs) See, there's a standard of living in the Old Testament, and there's a standard of living in the New Testament, right? The law and grace. You say, Pastor, we're under grace now. We don't need to follow the law no more. Well, let's weigh it out and see what's, what standard is higher. The Old Testament, right, there, there there was a law. You had to give a tithe, a 10%, the first fruit of your income, whether it was a crop or, or whatever it was. Like, you gave the first fruit. That was a law. You paid that to God. You, you offered that as a sacrifice. The tithe, that's where we get that word, the tenth from. That's the law, okay? Old Testament standard, you had to do that. That was a law. New Testament standard, give your life as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. Pick up your cross and carry it. 
what standard is higher, the old or the new? Because I can follow, the, oh, just give 10%? I can do calculator, there we go. The new, the new standard? Offer your life as a living sacrifice? The, okay, you didn't like that one. <laughs> the Old Testament law, don't cheat on your wife. Got it, I could do that. The, the New Testament standard, don't even look at a woman with lust or you, you've committed adultery in your own heart. Uh-oh. What standard is higher? The Old Testament, thou shalt not murder. I could do that. The New Testament, don't even hate your brother or it's like murdering him. Like, what are we even talking about? Do I have to tithe? What? What, what standard of, is higher, the old or the new? I can make a good old argument that the new standard, the, the grace standard is a lot higher because the, the Old Testament was about laws and, and following the rules. The, the New Testament standard is about checking your motives, guarding your heart, managing your thoughts. That's a lot harder to do. So, so in, in, a, in a context of a healthy, loving relationship with God, man, I, I, I get to serve. I, man, I get to give. A genuine disciple of Jesus is looking for, for ways to serve, looking for needs to meet, right? Looking to bless people, L- looking for ways that I can, I can honor people, I can serve people. Paul writes to the church in, in Corinth, he says, he says, God loves a cheerful giver. He, he's trying to encourage the church. Don't just give because there's people that need it. Man, God loves a cheerful giver. And so if you're not cheerful when you give, then you need to take that to God. And you need to go, God, why am I not cheerful? Why am I not joyful about things that I should be? Why don't I enjoy giving? Why don't I enjoy meeting the needs of my community? Why don't I enjoy blessing? And God will begin to deal with that with you. Because maybe you've been blinded by greed. Maybe you've put your own life needs in front of the, the, the life of those around you, the needs of those around you. Maybe, maybe someone else's negative experience with church or money has robbed you from your blessing. I don't know what it is, but you need to take that to God. See, what I'm talking about today is the root of your giving. Not just the fruit of your giving, the root, the root, the root. Proverbs 21, 2 says, a person may think their own ways are right, but the Lord, he weighs the heart. The Lord weighs the heart. See, see you can give and you can fool me, right? You, you can give and you can fool your spouse. You can give and you can fool those around you, but you, but you can't fool God. Because with God, all of our motives are exposed. So if I'm up here preaching and teaching, I can fool you, but I can't fool God. Like my motives are exposed to God. That's why David said in, in, in Psalm 139, search me, O God, and know my heart, Right? Search me, God. You've examined my heart. You know everything about me. You know when I sit down. You know when I stand up. You know my thoughts even when I'm far away. You see me when I travel. You see me when I rest at home. You know everything that I do. Search me, God. Examine me. Know me. Right? You you know what I'm going to say even before I say it. You you go before me and you follow me. You place your hand of blessing on my head. Such knowledge is too wonderful for for me to even know. Too great to understand. See, see, what is he saying? David is saying, the core of who I am, my heart, I want it to be healthy. The core of who I am, my, my root, I want it to be in line with you, God. That's what he's saying. It's not about the fruit, it's about the root. Because whatever is at the root ends up in the fruit. Write that down. Whatever is in the root will end up in the fruit. So if there's contamination in my heart, it's going to end up everywhere else. Proverbs 21, 27 says, the sacrifice of an evil person is detestable, especially when it's offered with wrong motives. Have you ever been sitting across with someone and you just knew their motives were bad? Like you sat with a sales guy and you're like, man, I could see through it. I see your motives. You don't have bad breath. You got commission breath, right? Like like you you just see their motives. Ladies, you ever been talking to a dude? You're like, I see right through him. Man, he ain't trying to know me. He don't care about nothing. He's trying to do something else. Like his motives are bad. He got no game, right? Don't look at him now, but you, got, you know guys with no game, ladies. Young folks call it riz, right? Got no riz. Got no riz. Um, but motives, mo- we're talking about motives. Um, see, the, the truth is I've been in your seat more than I've been in mine. 
I've listened to more messages on money than I've preached. And so I, I can say that as I've sat and I've listened to pastors and preachers and leaders talk about money, man, some of the messages I've been blessed. Some of the messages have been revelatory. Some of the messages I've, I've left going, man, that was so good. God, God spoke something to me and God, God gave me a new revelation of his word and how to steward the, the money and the finances and generosity. And there's some things that I got to deal with and they, they've blessed my life and changed my family's like dynamic. But some of them are like just trying to get me to do a business deal with God. Come on, you know those ones, right? If you give today, come on, God's going to give it back. Press down, shaking together, rolling over. The windows of heaven are going to come, right? You've heard those, right? Come on, just, just give and it will be. It's like trying to get me to do a business deal with God. But, but, but what if my root is contaminated? Does God still want to give me fruit if my root's messed up? See, that's why we got to examine our, our heart. Because Jesus said, no one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. So so Jesus understood something about what you and I do with money. We make it an idol. We make it God, don't we? See, we can be in church and we can go, man, this Jesus thing, I, I'm all in on Jesus, right? I, I give my life to Jesus. I give my kids to Jesus. I give my marriage to Jesus. I give my, I ain't give my money to Jesus. <laughs> right? I baptized people before and I've seen dudes holding up their wallet going under the water. Like, Lord, have all of me, just not my, not my money. <laughs> right? B- because Jesus knew that, that, that you and I have a tendency to make money God. And by the way, this statement, you can't serve both God and money, would have been so provocative back in the day because he's talking to a group of people who are in bondage to Rome. And he's saying, oh, you think the Romans are bad? You wait till you start serving money. Oh, you think the Romans are treating you bad? You wait how money treats you. Because money will have you up all night. Money will lead you to a nervous breakdown. Come on, money will, will cause a divorce, right? Money will have you fighting your spouse. You start serving money, oh, just wait till you see how money is as a master. See, I want you to have money. I just don't want money to have you. That's what you have to understand. And so if I have selfish motives at my core, like if I just want money so I'm seen more, if I want money so I'm viewed in a different light, if I want toys and houses and cars so people look at me differently, if my root is contaminated, what makes you think that God's going to give you more fruit? He's not. Why would he give you more of an idol? He's not. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 10 says this, For the love of money is the root of all evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. See, it's not money itself that's evil. It's the love of it that's evil. It'll cause you to walk away. It'll cause you to put money before God. But if you just go back a few verses, verse 6 says this, but godliness with contentment is great wealth. Godliness with contentment is great wealth. In other words, man, if I get more, I'm good. Hallelujah. Praise God. If I don't, I'm still good. Because, Because money don't have me. It's like the apostle Paul said. He said, man, I've learned the secret to life. I've been rich. I've been poor. Right? I've lived in tents, I've been shipwrecked, I've been full, I've been hungry. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. In other words, he's saying my, my root, my core, my heart is pure. See, that, that's where I'm trying to get us to today. That, that as we give, as we live a life of generosity, it's not just about the fruit, it's more about the root. See, I, I believe that God wants to get money to you. Why? So we can get money through you. It's, it's a tool. God, God wants to bless you. Why? So you can be a blessing. Like, like we, we're called to be not, not just like get a bunch of fruit, right? But we're called to distribute the fruit. A fruit distributor. You ever, you ever seen them at the park? I love going to the fruit guys at the park after my son's games. I find them. You know the dudes with the watermelon, cantaloupe, pineapple, mango, little tahini, little chamoy. It's about $48. <laughs> I love them. I, every, I'm a sucker. I, I pay for it every time. Every time I'm blessed, right? Every time I walk away going, God is good. I always got to find the fruit man. Come on, if you're a fruit man, I shout you out. Where are you at? Drop the, drop the location. Um, but, but that's how we should be, right? Like God, God wants to get fruit to us. And some of the fruit we eat, but some of it we give out. 
Right? See, some of us, God has, has given us gifts and talents and abilities in the mind to steward large amounts of money, to, to make up money. You say, Pastor, I want to know these people. That ain't me. Where, where are they at? Right? But, but, God, but God gives gifts and talents and abilities to, to steward this money. And see, God gives you fruit. God gives you resources so you can bless others, so you can meet needs, so you can build, so you can take care. It's not just for you. Yeah, some of it is, but not all of it. You've got to be a fruit distributor. See, the desire for more is not wrong. It's not wrong. The, the, the desire, the, the want to have more is not wrong. The question is more of what? And, and what route, what path are you taking to get the more? See, Jesus said his will, his heart, his desire for your life is, is that it's abundant, that it's overflowing, that it's rich, that it's full. He said, I came to give you life and life more abundant. John 10, 10, right? See, but he wants you to find that life in him. Not in money, not in things, not in possessions. Find that rich, satisfying life in him. This is a heart conversation. How's your heart? Proverbs 4, 23, above all else, guard your heart. Why? For everything you do flows from it. The wellspring of life, the new King James says. See, giving, generosity, man, it's this incredible opportunity for discipleship. It's an incredible opportunity for you to grow in your relationship with God because we've all been in those moments where you go, I'll be honest, God, I got more month than I do money. You ever been there? I, I, this, this month is running out. If there was about 22 days, I'll be good. Right? Like the, these overdraft fees are piling up. God, please don't let them cash this check today. I give them a couple days, right? You don't want that thing to bounce. We've all, I, I've been in positions many times where like, Lord, I don't know how I'm going to make payroll. I don't know how we're going to do it. But it's in these moments of, of, of real financial stress where you go, God, but I trust you. God, God, you've always shown up. God, you've always made a way. See, the, the testimony of the tither is always the same. God shows up. God provides. The testimony of the non-tither is always the same. When I get more, then I'll give. No, you won't. Because you don't give now. So when you get more, it's going to be a bigger amount. You still won't give. See, one of my favorite scriptures in all the Bible is, is Proverbs eleven twenty four, And it says this, the world of the generous gets larger and larger. But the world of the stingy gets smaller and smaller. See, most people, when they, when they make their way out of poverty or when they, you know, finally come up on something or you, or you finally can breathe. Come on, you know that feeling, right? You finally got a little bit of financial relief. Most people then live a life like this. God, I got a little bit now. Let me just hold on to what I have. A closed-fisted life. But God said if you live a life that's closed-fisted, the the, the world of the stingy gets smaller and smaller. But the world of the generous, uh, someone that lives life with an open hand, gets larger and larger. God says I can't bless, I can't give to a closed fist, but I can give to an open hand. Right? Your, Your world will get larger and larger. I'm not just talking about money. Your relationships, right, will we'll get larger and larger. I'm generous with my, you start being generous with your words, you watch what happens. All of a sudden, you got all kinds of friends. You start being stingy with your compliments, stingy with your words. You got a, you got a RBF all the time, a resting blessed face. <laughs> what did you think I was going to say? <laughs> right? But, but you start being you start, get, you start giving more than you're taking. And you watch your world will get bigger and bigger and bigger. And then you look at people and go, man, how are they just so blessed? Well, they're generous. The world of the generous gets larger and larger. Um, so, so let us not be a church. Let us not be a, a people that live life like this. Let us go, God, whatever you've given us, man, we're an open-fisted type of church. And, and by the way, whatever's in our hand is already yours, God. So, so, so hear my heart. Don't tithe. Don't give God 10% out of obligation and then be an idiot with the 90. That's not as hard either. It's like, I tithe. Now it's time to turn up. Hey. Like, <laughs> bro, well, that's not it. That's not what we're talking about. Like, like God, everything I have is yours. This business is yours. This, this resource is yours. This ministry is yours. This marriage is yours. These kids are yours. Have it. It's all yours. If you want me to give it away, I'll give it away. It's, it's all yours already, God. I, I want our world, this church, your life to get bigger 
and bigger because we're generous. And see, here's, here's the truth is that you can give without love, but you can't love without giving. So, so if you, you can give to things and to people and you're like, Ugh, I don't really want to do that, but I gave. Come on, we've all been there before. Like, bro, here you go, go away. But you can't have genuine love in your heart and not be a giver. I, I love this quote by, by Anne Frank. She said, um, no one has ever become poor by giving. The, 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 the great theologian, the apostle Olaf from Frozen, he said, <laughs> he said, he has a good quote. He said, love is putting someone else's needs before your own. Come on, he's preaching. See, it's not about just you putting money in the offering plate. It's not, a ju- it's not just about an offering that we're taking. It's, it's not even about that. It, it's, it's about going, God, my life is in that offering holy and pleasing to you. Everything I have is for you. It's, it's about having an attitude of gratitude because we've been the recipients of God's grace, of his love, of his mercy, of his kindness. See, we don't give to, to get. No, church. We give to give again. It's a different way to think about it. And so what I love about our church is, is that, man, we got so many people who are just faithful who give, who love, who sow, and look around. Like, God is good. Someone said all the time. That ain't Forrest Frank. That's the old church folks. Right? So, so we're, we give not to get a bigger building. Although, come on, we got, we got dreams. We got vision. We got, and, the, and can I just say this without saying it? Man, God's on the move. God. I, I don't know how it's all going to work together, but God's on the move. God, God is up to something. You look around, we got folks standing up, like God's on the move. Th- this is not it, man. We got, we got big dreams around here. We're building a campus. We're building a school. Like we're going for it. We're, we're three years in. Give us another 30. You watch what happens. You hear what I'm saying? Like th- this is, we're not like, look, mama, we made it. This ain't it. God has so much more in store. Um, but, but we're going to live life like this. Man, we're generous. We're, we're blessed. We're designed to be givers, by the way. Every good parent knows this principle to be true that, man, it's more blessed to give than it is to receive Acts 20, right? It's more blessed to give than to receive. Come on, you know how your kids are on, on Christmas, on their birthday? Man, man their receiving is your blessing. You, you don't get up because you want to get up early. You, you get up because you want to see them be blessed. Receive so you can be blessed, right? We're, we're made in the image of, likeness of God. And God so loved the world that he gave. Right? Romans 8, 32. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him for us all. How will he not, how will he not also uh, with him generously give us all things? See, if the Father has given us Jesus, can I just encourage you? And he's not holding anything from you. He's not withholding stuff from you. He, he gave us Jesus. And so I'm trying to move our hearts today towards generosity, not just in here, but in life. God, God, I want you to use our gifts, our talents, our abilities, our resource, our our relational capital, our intellectual capital, our spiritual capital, our financial capital to, to leverage it and grow the kingdom of God. And watch what God begins to do. He'll begin to bless and bless and bless and bless. When we go, God, everything we have is yours. I'll, I'll end with this story. There's a, um, a Division One basketball team in the South, and in their preseason, they were going to travel to Africa and play a bunch of teams over in Africa. And so they get there, they land, and this team, their their sponsor, they, they got all the gear, they got all the stuff, and they, they show up to play the first African team. And um, they're looking right across the court. They're watching. They're, they're sizing their opponent up, right? I mean, excuse me. Excuse me. They notice uh, two of the guys only have one shoe on, and so the Americans they begin to laugh. <laughs> Dude, look at these, look at these dudes with one shoe. And um, so the coach notices his players start start kind of making fun of the other team, and so the coach goes to their coach and says, "Hey, what's the deal with the two players with one shoe?" And um, he goes, "Well, my team they're they're so excited that the Americans are here to play, and typically we got one of our one of our guys." 
he always plays with no shoes because he can't afford shoes and we can't afford to get him shoes. So he just plays with no shoes. But man, he was so excited that the Americans were coming. So they wanted to impress you guys. And so one of my other players said, hey, you have one of my shoes and I'll wear one, you wear one. And that way they don't think like lower of us. And um, when, when I heard this story, I, I was just thinking like, man, the heart of that one player to go, hey, man, my shoes aren't the best. I only got one pair, but you could have one of mine too. So we can impress them so, so they don't look down on us. Like, here's what I'm trying to say. Don't think that you gotta be so blessed, that you gotta have so much money, that you gotta be overflowing, that you gotta have more, all this resource to, to finally bless people. No, you can bless someone right where you're at. You can bless someone in your lack. <laughs> you say, yeah, my, my shoes are falling apart, but we'll, we'll wear one busted up shoe together. Right? I, I don't have much, but, but let's not have much together. I, I'm barely making it. Come on, let's barely make it together. I got you. Don't, don't wait till you get there, right? I've done, a, I've done a whole series on this, destination addiction. Don't wait till you get there to finally think you're going to do something. No, you can give right now. You can serve right now. You, you can give your shoe right now. And with that heart, I believe God goes, now they're a candidate that I could pour out my blessing on them, that I could open up the windows of heaven because now it's not about the fruit. Now it's about the root. Now they go, man, they're not, they're, they're not even worried about the, the blessing. They're, they're more in love with the blessor. Right? Man, I, come on, you can give right where you're at. You can love right where you're at. You can pray right where you're at. You say, Pastor, I don't, I don't have enough words to pray. Yeah, you do. I don't have enough money to give. Yeah, you do. I don't, I don't have enough time to, to serve. Yeah, you do. God's just looking for an open heart. It's a heart check today. How's your heart? How's your heart? How's your heart? Let me pray for you. Lord, I thank you for what you're doing in this house. I thank you for every single person in here. God, I pray that they hear my heart today, that this is not about money. This is about our life. This is about stewarding and managing the resource, the gift, the talent, the ability, the money, the, the blessing that you've given us. God, we're, we're so blessed. God, we want to bless others. And God, I pray today that someone hears this message and they go, Man, God, my, my heart is, is contaminated. My heart is, is poisoned. God, would you begin to do a work in my life? Would you search me, oh God? Would you begin to remove the, the greed or remove the, the idol of self or the idol of money? God, I want a clean heart. I, I want to be lined up with your ways. I want to be blessed to be a blessing. I want to give to give again. God, I want everything that you want for my life. God, I offer my life as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to you. This is our true and our proper worship. God, hear the heart of this church. God, we want to serve you, honor you, and bless you with everything. God, let us not be a church that lives with closed fists, but a church that lives with an open hand. That whatever you give us, we're going to give it right back to those around us. Because we love you, God. We worship you. We're made in your image and your likeness, and you didn't withhold anything from us. You gave us Jesus, your one and only son, that whoever would believe in him would not perish, but have everlasting, eternal life. With a simple, true belief in their heart in a simple confession that Jesus is Lord, you tell us that our whole world can be changed. We'll go from death to life, from blind to sight, from hell to heaven in one moment. If that's you in here today, you've never given your life to Christ. I want to offer you that opportunity right now in this moment. Jesus died for you, that while you were still a, a sinner, while you were far off cursing God and mocking God, didn't even believe in God, he died for you, gave his life for you. What an uneven exchange. Gives you an opportunity to live a savior's life because he died a sinner's death. Right now, if that's you in here today, no magical prayer, no repeat after me, just a simple confession and a true belief between you and God. Tell him, I'm a sinner. I'm messed up. I'm in need of a savior. I've done life my own way for too long. Today is the day I choose to put my faith, my trust, and my hope in you, Jesus. Today, I make you my Lord and my savior. If that's you in here today, just between you and God, tell him, I make you my Lord and my savior today. Old things have passed away. All things have become new. I'm a new creation in Christ Jesus. Come on, right now, just between you and God, I'm a sinner. I'm messed up. I repent of my sins. I turn from my wicked ways, and I turn to you, God. Have all of me. Have my life, Lord. I follow you. I believe that life with you is so much better. If that's you in here today, I just want to acknowledge you. Lift your hand in the air. No one's looking around. I just want to see you. Come on, if that's you in here today, I see you. 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 Hands up all over the room. I see you. Thank you, Lord. Anyone else? I just want to acknowledge you. I see you back there. I see you back there. I see you right here. 
I see you right here. Man, I'm so grateful. God is so good. Come on, church. Just give him praise, give him thanks. In Jesus' mighty name, amen, amen, and amen.